morning. Here we are again at the beginning of 2021. I thought that we ought to think in terms today of some of the artifacts that we have here in this shop that tie us to history and let us appreciate the cultures that Western civilization has been derived from. So I'm going to take a few minutes here, let Micah take a few minutes, and he's going to visit with us about these pieces of furniture that are on either side and in front of this spot right here. Thank you. This is Micah Christensen. He is one of the owners of the business. He is my son. Those of you who know him know how dynamic he is and uh, uh, he sets an example for us in uh, his knowledge and his perspective and uh, I think you'll uh, enjoy listening to him. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dad. Well, the pieces that are in front of us are Spanish in nature. They're called varagüenos. I've spent a lot of time in Spain as part of my uh, PhD work on Spanish art. And these are the kinds of objects that you will find in decorative arts museums, historical museums uh, throughout, throughout Spain. They date back to a very uh, medieval and um, widely European, not just Spanish kind of furniture that is called a cabinet on a stand. It's that simple, cabinet on a stand, because it comes in two parts. The cabinet, which um, is separate from the part at the bottom, and it was meant to be a kind of touring piece of furniture. It was very practical. When you were a king or a lord uh, in feudal times, rather than have a capital, which was a later innovation of European governments, you would tour from one province to the next in order to settle the business of the kingdom. And this was your laptop. It would close. Very early models of this would um, be fortified with metal that would go around the sides and the tops. It would be a strong box uh, that would have a key. And if you opened it up, you would have all kinds of drawers like you do here. And the drawers would contain legal documents, seals, anything that was needed to conduct the business of the kingdom. And the base was simply a fold-out stand. As time went on, the cabinet on a stand became the symbol of the royalty itself. And so you would find in royal households symbolic cabinets on stands. And it, as, uh, as more people were empowered, as chateaus and as castles became more prevalent, then noble households would have their own cabinets on stands that they would keep pieces in. And it became a way to reflect your, your values, your status. In Spain, it took a little different twist than it did in other parts of Europe. So an Italian cabinet on stand would often reflect uh, a connection to the ancient past of Rome and Greece. And in Spain, it reflected a lot of religious beliefs. So this one in particular, which is, I believe it goes back to the 15th century, the 1400s, it reflects the Spanish empire, well, really kingdom at the end of the 15th century. You have the uh, wood, which was from Spain, and it would have been carved in Spain, and it would have been done by the same sculptors who would have been involved in cathedral making. Here you have all of these Gothic elements, and you have the crucifixion and the descent from the cross. And then on the base, on the stand portion, you have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, Luke, and John. When you open it, you 
see this lock, which is very Spanish, Spanish iron and steel later. All of this very colorful work is the height of fashion in the, in the 15th and early 16th century. They are Limoges enameled plaques. Limoges, France is where they were made, and they depict the life of Christ on the exterior, and then in the interior, we have all of the 12 apostles. Now this piece would have been a standing desk as we think of today. It would have been functional. Desks did not really appear until the late 17th century in France, the ones that we think of today with Carl de Mazarin's um, desk that was made by Pierre Gaulle. This would have been how you, where you would have conducted business from, but it also would have been a place of worship. This could have been in the front hall. It could have also been in the private chapel of the home and you would have said your evening prayers and had objects that were of importance to the family religiously on it perhaps votive candles this piece is a little different and it's the kind of thing that is more common to be seen in spain because of all the gold and the um these painted um, I think it's, it, there's, there's an element of encaustic or wax work that's being done in this. And this, these columns and these colors are a reflection of Spain's Moorish past. Um, so you would see this in Seville, you would see it in um, the south of Spain, and it too, if you close it, you can see how decorative the exterior is. But this piece isn't as, isn't as religious. This piece is more of a practical piece, but extravagant. Look at how extravagant the base is with its gold leafing, and how the interior, when you open it up, just pops. seen in our day consistent light on objects but if you were in a Spanish household and at night and this was candle lit it would have glimmered it would have sparkled as the flames flickered and that is adding light to the atmosphere where you are so imagine your furniture almost feeling like it's glowing it would have in a large Spanish household been visible through almost any part of, of the house or, or the room. So I joke that this piece behind me and down here is what happens when a daddy and a mommy Bargueño get together, <laughs> this baby Bargueño. And, and this object, even though it seems like a toy, is probably more um, in the tradition of being a portable, safekeeping the kind of thing that you would have to it's its exterior is all it's very old and it's all str um, metal strapping and uh, and and uh, and riveting that has gone in it would have been a very secure object uh, it's the kind of thing that if you had a you know our briefcases of today with their locks this would have been the kind of thing that held the most precious objects that uh, a nobleman or woman would have carried with them. And the stand, it comes much later because the stands were replaced over and over again. This piece, if we had to go in order of age, what do you think, Dad? Would this be the oldest? No. Oh. This would be the oldest. No. Oh. This perhaps next. Uh -huh. So this would be third quarter of the 15th century. This would probably be- you Think of Columbus. Yeah. This would have been the age of Columbus, right? This would have been um, probably first or second half of the 16th century. Mm. So about the time when when uh, when uh, the, the Americas is really being explored. 
And this piece here would have probably been late to last half of the 17th century. So you're seeing three objects over a period of 200 years, 250 years, which is older than the United States. All of these objects are older than our country, and this one probably dates to before the European arrival in the Americas. Um, so when Tony talks about history, this is this is history, and this is our stewardship of it. Would you like to add anything? Yeah, I would like to visit a little bit. I don't want to take too long. <clears throat> I always think in terms of historic perspective, in uh, uh, 1874, when my grandfather was born, uh, <clears throat> his, uh, my great-great-great-grandfather was alive, my great-great-grandfather was alive, and my great-grandfather was alive. And all of these four grandfathers could have gotten together, I suppose. And uh, not that they did. I guess they did from the perspective of uh, posterity. Uh, <clears throat> but my great-great-great-grandfather would have known people who knew people uh, when the pilgrims came over uh, in the early 1600s. We're really not separated by much from uh, religious practice, from history, from the strivings of mankind, from the commonality. Uh, I think yesterday when we had a client come in who was a very wealthy man by today's standards, uh, he was carrying a small backpack he dumped out uh, some things onto my desk, which included his passport. He has his own jet, so he keeps his passport with him so he can run around. And uh, wrote out a check for us, and, uh, and his whole life was in that little phone that he had. He could communicate with any of his uh, 40 or 50 companies, and uh, he could uh, do the things that he needed. These things were confined to the world in which people live, to the space that they live, to the tradition they lived in. In today's world, we have a great deal of freedom. Uh, we talk about uh, when this was uh, made, uh, Columbus uh, was roaming the earth in his uh, small bark, if you will. And... Uh, at the same time was the Spanish Inquisition, which of course killed a large number of Jews and non-believers. A lot of them converted, but uh, my grandfather's family, and he was a Jew from, uh, from uh, the Pale of Settlement in Europe, would have been part of that, that uh, persecution at the time. And, uh, but he could have gone back in his family to, uh, to the Jews who were uh, taken to Babylon. When, uh, when Daniel spoke to King Nebuchadnezzar and spoke to him of the vision of the stone being cut out without hands that would fill the whole earth, my grandfather's grandparents going back perhaps 30 to 40 generations, were part of those people who were standing there with Daniel. You know, we are part of a great thing here upon this earth. And these things remind us of that. It allows us to meditate and to think and to appreciate and to understand where we have come from and what parts we wish to gather around us mentally and physically to remind us of the great heritage that is ours. We wish you to be well at this time. We wish you to be at peace. And we hope that you are content in your lives and with your families and friends. And we wish you all the best. Thank you.